Hi, 3DMJers. This is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. For the first time ever, I'm joined by all the guys in my own living room for this special live Q&A episode. In case you hadn't noticed, we took a couple weeks off of podcast publishing and blog publishing in order to have some downtime through the Thanksgiving holiday and to enjoy a first ever coach's vacation with the whole crew. So we all did it here. So they all went on vacation. I was in having like a staycation, if you will. And while the guys were here at my home in Austin, Texas, we asked Eric and Alberto to create Instagram posts requesting audience questions so we could record this bad boy. And we actually had a ton of people come through. Um, So many, in fact, that we'll be doing another full podcast episode based on these questions. And we also recorded an additional two hours worth of videos for the 3DMJ Vault, which will be released later this year. So in this particular episode, we go over when to add isolation movements to your training regimen, loose skin, breast augmentation, maximal recoverable volume, protein intake, drop sets and supersets, when to get a coach, adrenal fatigue, why we can't prescribe macros over Instagram, why we typically don't recommend having teenagers run intense dieting phases, each of our personal sports goals, and what our vision is going forth as a team, as 3D Muscle Journey in in all that we have to do here in this world. So yeah, it was a whole, whole lot. And again, it's just this is just the first piece of content from all these questions. So if you're one of those people who submitted, um, thank you so, so, so much, as the Q&A format is really our favorite thing to do as a group. We really, really appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get into it. As usual, if you have any feedback or comments on this episode that you're listening to, you can leave them at 3dmusclejourney.com under podcast number 74 or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team 3dmj. So here is Q&A session four with all five of us. Yours truly, Brad Loomis, Jeff Alberts, Alberto Nunez, and Eric Helms. All right, so our first question <laughs> is from Lulu Lemon with two N's. And eyes, right? There's eyes. Liu Liu at Lemon. So it's L-I-U-L-I-U-L-E-M-O-N-N on my Instagram. Thank you for posting this question. What do you view as an adequate strength base uh, from doing major compound movements before the need to add an isolation movements? So this person has been doing strength training for roughly two years and is at a thousand pound total on his big three at 185 pounds, six feet tall. Should he continue just focusing on building the big three or pivot for a bit to a bodybuilding block? Depends on the goals. Why don't you talk more about that? I would love to talk more about that because I love talking. Um, so if you want to be a power lifter and you are continuing to get strong in the compound lifts, then that's great. And you don't need to do anything different because it is working. But if you're wanting to build a physique, I would say your accessories matter just as much as your compounds from the get-go, in my opinion. Do you, what do you all think? Yeah. And I have a hard time believing anyone starts off from a beginner doing that. Like they usually... They crave some variety in their training. Yeah. Like, that's someone who... That's impressive, first yeah. off. It's really yeah. cool that you just Very start to compounds. Rare. Like, I know what I want, and this is... All I'm, yeah. I'm going to do the... Or I'm going to do what's essential for my goal, and not be distracted by these other shiny things, And but maybe there's a point where I might need them. Um, now, I would say that early on, like, you can get by with something very straightforward... Um, I would say that somewhere after the beginner phase, once you kind of have those movements down, uh, perhaps, yeah, throwing in, and not necessarily like bodybuilding specific work, but perhaps um, a few volume blocks can help a lot with strength gain because that intermediate phase is where you're going to put on a, a good chunk of your muscle and that can contribute quite a bit to your... To the lifting. To okay. your lifting, yeah. So it might not be a bad idea to start, you know, perhaps adding a bit more volume to, to those movements. And um, I think like, it sounds like they're doing something very starting strength-ish, uh, which like if you go to the intermediate program, kind of does that anyways. Yeah. Um, but adding secondaries, I guess that's if you want biceps along with a the squat, then I, that's I would. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it depends on the goal. I would say, assuming you have general strength and physique goals, yeah. I think, um, so it's kind of what it sounds like, mm-hmm. and I may be totally off base here. I think you should look at thinking about what does the squat bench and deadlift not train. So you probably want to have some upper body pulling, like a vertical pull, 
a horizontal pull and then a vertical push. And then with a squat and a deadlift, you've pretty much got everything. If you just did those two things, if you weren't too finicky about your physique, you'd be fine. If you were, then you'd probably want to add in like bicep curls, calf raises, and a hamstring curl on top of that, and then you're good to go. It's a very minimalist program that's appropriate for intermediate. And if you're really just doing the big three, just adding in that is plenty of additional volume. Yeah. Uh, but I have a feeling you're probably doing just a little more than just the big three. Yeah. And it could be, in a lot of ways, like you said, blocks. Like I would prefer, like maybe that's just one day a week, you do your accessory, two days mm -hmm. a week, you throw in the accessory. There's a lot of ways you could do it, but um, personally, if I'm doing anything, I'd like to do it at least twice a week, but that's just me. I have to. Did we answer that? Anything? Well, I, yeah, and just outside yeah. of how give it purpose. Like yeah. Eric said, the only thing that was really missing in my opinion was the, the, the pulling, the rowing and the pull downs and the things like that. Outside of that, I mean, if you don't care about biceps, don't do curls. Yeah. Yeah. Just get your pulling in there. But or if you calves. care about biceps, get your biceps in there. Yeah. And even calves. I mean, some people won't care about their calves. And I was like, well, don't, don't train them. You're going to get a, plenty of ankle mobility yeah. from your squats and things like that. So just have purpose to it. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know. No, I guess it's just hard to pinpoint because we don't know the exact goal. Yeah. yeah. Um, we hope that helps, though. Yeah. <laughs> we do. We hope it helps. Yeah. Okay. Next. Also from Liu Liu Lemon. <laughs> I say it so well. Do you have any specific suggestions for getting rid of loose skin from prior body fat loss? This will be a pretty quick question because it's an unfortunately simple answer. Um, but basically the question is the context, uh, light, moderate case of loose skin from going from 30% body fat to 10%, uh, currently 25 years old. So skin is elastic, but only to a point. Uh, the good news is you are 25, and from your earlier question, you're 6 foot 185 pounds, it means you've probably got a fair amount of muscle to put on. So I can say that it will only get better, but to truly make any huge dent if you have a lot of loose skin, that may take surgery. However, I would give it some time. Like mm -hmm. once you're at a decent body comp, like you know, less than 20% and your body weight starts at a two, if you can get to that, you will probably see a substantially better amount of loose skin and it'll take you some years to do that. Um, and that will hopefully see some large improvements and then I'd, I'd reassess again maybe when you're like late 20s. Yeah, that's funny that when he first said that we all went, oh, because yeah. I wouldn't have expected that you were 25. Like, you know, because it's typically, someone later in life. But when he said 25, I was like, oh, then there is some, some, some yeah, there's some hope that could get filled up by a muscle. But most of the time that question is like, yeah, surgery or it's there. And that, you know, it's not fun to say, but it's what it is. Same with stretch marks, same with, that's about it. And in minor cases, sometimes it's not as noticeable as like the person actually thinks. Yeah. Like they actually look quite good. And it's that little yeah. detail that they're like, uh, yeah, because a lot of on. women, I mean, a lot of female competitors that have had kids, there's just that one area with mm -hmm. a little bit of skin, and some of them can still look freaking mm -hmm. great, kick ass on stage with it, um, but some it's just psychologically messes with them to the point where, you know, and like a, that's why I got breast implants, was because I dieted, lost it, and then the boobs never came back, so I wanted to fill up that skin. It's mm -hmm. actually um, a really common thing among female competitors. Yeah. There's something specific to breast fat that when you diet it, it doesn't grow back the same with it. I think you actually get a uh, fat cell, a pop, I can never pronounce it. Cell apoptosis. Death. Apoptosis, thank you. I went to school, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like three things that was one of the useless ones. Though. The, the major use of her master's degree is helping remember words. <laughs> when she heard that, she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'll need that one if Eric, um, although I don't know who he is yet. <laughs> Yeah, but it's just, it sucks. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty common. We haven't talked about that on the podcast. Boot jobs. Yeah. Not that we should go there because I don't. But that, when you say loose skin, that that's like, the first thing I think of is like, I was, and it's not like anyone in my life was like, your boobs look terrible. <laughs> it was just a personal thing that, and for the listeners who probably see me somewhere else in the world on the internet, most people can't tell I have them because I went really modestly, mm -hmm. but it would, and I'm not a very, also if you've seen on the internet, I'm not really huge on appearances being perfect all the time, but it was so emotionally upsetting to me and um, that I wanted these, this little, like the smallest boob job I could possibly have, but I needed it um, in order to feel the way I wanted to feel. Mm. So it's not, um, 
would say it's not a shameful thing because obviously I felt ashamed in whatever way I needed it, but it's not uncommon. And I hope you're not ashamed of it because it's, it's pretty. It's a valuable tangent because I'm sure once we got on the subject of breasts, there were some girls out there that were like, ah, you keep going because it, yeah. it is a very common thing and we've never brought it up. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely girls too that don't need it or do need or Like, I've seen girls in my stitch that ended up with like double D's and like that's obviously mm-hmm. not how I wanted yeah. to roll. Yeah. Um, there's also new, there's new surgical options available. Like now at this stage of time, you can actually do fat transfer to breasts. So you don't actually have to get an implant. That's something that's... Cool actually like approved and been studied now okay huh. so you can actually just get fat taken off another part of your body and put it into oh yeah they do that for booties all the time mm-hmm. i've yeah. seen it on the booties but never i didn't think about it for the booties yeah they oh, do it a lot for um when they have to do a vasectomy oh. so they'll like slowly build build the breast tissue back up by doing fat transfer uh, cool how else could that be useful i can still bench press i could still for the listener if you are a girl who this interests I, if actually, okay, if you go to my personal YouTube channel and type in boob or bo- boobs and bodybuilding, I think is what I called it. I have like a 20 minute story on how that went. So we'll link that somewhere in the show notes. Perfect. So we don't have to take up any more, but yeah, it, 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 it was a big deal for me and I have no problem talking about it. So, but watch that video first cause it might answer some stuff. So thank you, Lululemon, 25 year old male for your questions about uh, breast surgery. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but no, that was really, <laughs> sorry. That was still a very good tangent. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Next. One. <laughs> next one is from Edio Perez. What is your opinion on adding sets week to week so as to try and reach your MRV, that's maximum recoverable volume, before a deload week versus keeping number of sets constant for the most part throughout the block? Okay. So that was the popularized by. Israel. Yes, Dr. Mike Israel uh, came up with the concept of basically trying to uh, make sure that you're doing as much volume as you can before it becomes detrimental uh, to maximize like hypertrophy and strength because there is a more or less uh, I wouldn't say linear but a solid relationship between doing more volume and getting bigger and not as quite a solid relationship between doing more volume and getting stronger. Um, I think the tough part about the MRV concept is that the place where you've reached your MRV is the position right before when you add more volume and you actually backslide. So you see your strength go down week to week. But the way it actually, like the relationship is actually that as you keep adding more volume, eventually you'll start to progress slower before you actually backslide. So you've kind of, if you actually push the point where you're going backwards, you've gone past the point of, you're on the other side of the, of, of the slope, essentially. Um, and then, okay, then, which is fine if the argument is, well, the more you overreach, the greater the gains will be. But I don't know that that's actually a, well, people say that, the overreaching, like the more you push, and then if you de- deload, you'll get really, really strong. I don't know how much of the effect is worth it. Um, and you can do a lot of volume before you, like, actually start backsliding week to week. And also, how do you know the backslide wasn't just because you had a bad week? or something mm-hmm. other else. So it's, I appreciate where, where Mike is coming from with trying to objectively define what's an appropriate amount of volume. And probably going through that process will tell you some things, but I don't know that it's a very consistent value and I don't know that overreaching will be a beneficial thing to do on a regular basis that will be worth the cost and the potential burnout and risk of injury of doing a ton of volume. So, um, all due respect to Mike, and it's always tough whenever you create a system because you expose yourself to criticism, you know, and it's much easier just to go strictly by the research and just say, I don't know. So I applaud him for trying to create a system, but I'm not a big fan of the concept of MRV. Okay. I imagine if you're not very experienced that attempting to find that would be very difficult to do correctly. Mm-hmm. I think it's, for me, it's still hard to find where yeah. it is 32 <laughs> years later. Yeah. And it just kind of depends on a lot of outside variables as well. Well, it speaks to people differently too, because some people might take that as, you know, be cautious with just adding more work. And, you know, if you're making good progress, well, then just kind of chill within that area and keep progressing with that. But what it does to a lot of people, unfortunately, I feel is like they want to 
get that close to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that's this week. <laughs> and that's the issue. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is actually a, a, an overriding issue in the fitness industry is that people tend to find the expert that they can manipulate what they're saying yeah. into supporting what they want to do anyway. Mm-hmm. So like all the volume junkies love Mike mm-hmm. Isertel, even though he's not saying I don't think that's what he meant at all. Yeah. No, yeah. He, like we've talked about it and we're kind of on kind of the same page. He thinks there's a Goldilocks zone where mm-hmm. you're doing an appropriate amount of volume but not too much. I think how we get there and what we define it by and what criteria we use is a little different. But I think in the end, he's saying don't do too much. There's, a, there's an appropriate amount and it's different for everybody. And that when people who want to do all the volume here is got it. So I should do the maximum amount of volume I can do while still recovering. And I'll define recovery as waking up tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I'll define it however I want it. Yeah. I do. I kind of like the concept, but um, again, it just depends on the training age of the person. I know I couldn't do that much more than probably about two or three weeks just add a set. Hmm. But, you know, I've been in the gym for 20 some years, so someone that someone might be able to handle it if they're only like two or three years old in a gym. Yeah. And he would, I think you would want to do it conservatively. Maybe add a set one week, add another set, deload, assess, maybe start again. Because I, I mean, the last thing you'd want to do is just because you always forget about the accumulation of fatigue from week to week to week to week, even if you don't add anything. And so that's always kind of something that kind of throws the monkey wrench in the works of where is that magical MRV? Because you never really can find that until you've actually kind of filled that cup too full. Is yeah. it like the differences in volume too can impact your recovery, would you say? Like if you're just throwing in fluff, fluff sets versus... Like, lo- like mm-hmm. the load increases are going to probably affect your recovery exactly. differently. Yeah. Um, also stressing at your joints as well, too. Like doing a set of 10 is not going to stress my joints, as, me personally, as much as doing, let's say, a few sets of like four. Yeah. And that's actually a really good point, Jeff. And that the way Mike talks about it is that you would be messing around with this concept in a volume block. Mm-hmm. So, because not all volume is created equal. Like Jeff said, adding endless sets of triples is a great way to feel terrible and to really shorten the length of your block before your IT bands just feel like fire. Um, like if we're talking about deadlifts or squats. Adding sets of 10 that finish at an RPE of seven on like lat pull downs, yeah, you could you probably just get sore and there wouldn't be really any you know huge issue with that. But um, yeah, like it only makes sense to me if, if it was true, if we assumed that the amount that you pushed past the point where you were, where it was directly beneficial, where you're starting to overreach, was proportionate to how much payoff you got, mm-hmm. or additional, or like super compensatory. You know, that's the only way it makes sense. Because if you push MRV by adding a set every week, you're going to have to deload really frequently. Mm-hmm. It's going to have to be like every three or four weeks, you know, and a serious deload too. Because if you just like the way we do deloads, is often like we'll drop a set mm-hmm. and we'll drop the RPE by one. That's you're still gonna get a training effect from this. Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah, you need more. Yeah. But if you have gone from three sets to four sets to five sets on everything, you're gonna need a week where you're doing like one or two sets. You might you, you might want to just take the week off. Yeah, you know? and I, I don't know that the payoff is worth the cost. Was that the question? Week to week, mm-hmm. by yeah, set, add, adding a set, adding a set. Ooh, each yeah, week. yeah. That adds up quick. Yeah, mm-hmm. that sure does. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. I kind of want to just direct you, Alvaro, to the muscle and strength pyramids because you're asking about uh, protein intakes in different cases. Um, If you guys don't mind, I'll just knock this out of the park real quick. So protein intake. um, (laughs) I'll just kick ass real quick. Because this is kind of my my specialty, I guess. Well, I just wanted to like wrote a thesis on it or something? I might have. I may have. (laughs) So I originally recommended protein intakes higher for cutting. Uh, lower for bulking because you had more calories and ideally maybe more protein is going to be used for energy when you're cutting so you'd need more protein than that to offset uh, any potential lean body mass losses. I would actually say there's not a bunch of clear data showing that you need higher protein intake when dieting to ensure uh, lean body mass retention but there are a lot of benefits to high protein diets when dieting. For example additional satiety burning more calories, and regardless, you you are probably going to benefit from a higher protein intake in general. Uh, I would say that where I'm confident you will make sure you're getting all of the benefits 
is probably right around like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 grams per pound. And then your mileage may vary. You can go higher than that. I think a very safe way to do it is to be, you know, no higher than 1.2, 1.3 grams per pound when dieting. And if you feel that's cutting too much into your carbs and fat, you can safely go down to like a gram per pound. And then in the off season, you can go as low as 0.8 grams per pound if you find that you're too satiated and you actually need to get your energy intake higher. Uh, and there is some research showing that very high protein intakes make it harder to gain body fat, probably because it's just harder to eat as much and maybe from the thermic effect of food. So if you specifically struggle to gain weight uh, at the right rate and you're gaining too quickly, there's nothing wrong with going as high as 1.5, 1.6 grams per pound. I know it's very high, it's unnecessarily high, but purely just to keep you satiated uh, so long as you are healthy and you uh, have all your functioning organs and have no contraindications to a high protein diet. Boom shakalaka. And anyone else can of course chime in. I just figured I'd knock it out real quick. Out of the park. Babe Ruth over here. Okay. Uh, here's a good question. <laughs> From TJ Scheisman asks, when is the appropriate time to use drop sets, supersets, and sets to failure, or are they even relevant? And how do you properly progress on sets like these? I always see people doing them, but they never really giving an explanation as to what the importance is. Thank you. So someone else. Oh. Was it drop sets? Drop sets, you, did you just did supersets a... and sets to failure. So let's just start with drop sets and supersets. Okay, you just Definitely. addressed it really well in your case study Q and A yeah. number two. I think drop sets are valuable if uh, someone doesn't have um, a lot of extra time to train. They're they're uh, time saving. I think more than anything. Uh, the biggest issue with uh, drop sets is that most people just kind of do them blindly without any specific structure. So. Um, I think, um, for example, if, if um, you structure your drop sets so that um, you can track progress closely or, or, or lack of progress, I think uh, they're, they're, they're a great way to go about it. Um, the, so that, that's probably my main issue. I think they're, 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 they're a wonderful option for those of us who have uh, limited time to train, and the same thing can be said about, about supersets. And, You've uh, you've written a few times about supersets and yep. how, how maybe they're not only good in regards to helping you save time, um, but also perhaps there can be some some benefits to pairing certain muscle groups yep. uh, together. Yes, yeah, so I would not to pimp our stuff too much, but I would check out the case study Q and A on hypertrophy. I believe yes, number yeah. two. Uh, yeah, Berta talks a good about bit about this, and I'd also recommend Max. We've reviewed a number of articles on. Uh, drop sets and supersets. Um, so the thing with research is you're always comparing A to B, not A to A and B, you know, or a unique combination of the two. So there's actually research showing that drop sets compared to an equal number of just straight up sets might be better for hypertrophy. And if you think about it, that's because all that volume is effective because you're starting in a fatigued state. But you wouldn't train only with drop sets. That's a programming strategy, not like a, an entire encompassing way to do it. And the reason why I wouldn't just remember recommend always doing drop sets is it's really hard to track progress. So you take a, a semi-trained group of 10 people and you have them do a shit ton of drop sets for eight weeks, yeah, they'll grow a lot. But if you take an advanced bodybuilder who doesn't really know how to track, you know, you run the rack on lateral raises, like how do you progress on that? I don't know, you know, you'd have to track every single one of those drops. So I think it's a useful time-saving strategy. You can get some decent volume on that. You probably want to do it on exercises that are low risk. Uh, and then as far as supersets, I really like doing antagonist paired sets. That's basically you do the opposite pattern to what you were doing. So like if you did a leg extension, you would then superset that with a leg curl. Or you did a bicep curl with a tricep extension. Or an upper body push with an upper body pull. Um, you want to do it with low fatiguing exercises or the cardiovascular strain will be an issue. But there's some data showing that this actually helps performance, so you're perhaps uh, potentiating the other muscle group, if you will. So I think those are useful ways to save time without potentially harming performance where you can still track the, uh, the progress. And why tracking is important is in your latest article. Um, this is true. Check out uh, my rant where I got annoyed at people doing random workouts. <laughs> Randomness. Randomness. Randomness everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the things that I find that's kind of annoying about drop sets is how inconsistent the form can be. Mm -hmm. So what Good volume point. that you may end up increasing through doing a drop set, you're actually losing because 
you're using more momentum, maybe your range of motion is cut short, yeah. and, and things like that. And so I think if, if we use our tier system of good, better, best, um, or maybe in this case, bad, worse, and worser, <laughs> I think that I think that my my personal opinion is just drop sets are worse. Whereas, like Eric said, um, you know, supersets are I'm, uh, yeah, supersets and, and, and multi setting um, not only great for saving time, but you can kind of strategically place that not only with antagonist body parts, but um, you can just do whole different muscle groups. Yeah. Like for example, today being a little bit pressed for time, I want to say that I did biceps, calves, and and um, triceps or something like that. I think yesterday you did glute bridges and curls. Yeah, there's no. another one. Yeah, I did glute bridges and curls. So, and, and those of course are so different that form is still very consistent. One is not taking away from the other and I can't actually progress in the manner that we have outlined. So yeah. that's, that's not worse or that's, you know, <laughs> thank you. So really briefly, I guess on, on drop sets, like there's a, a lot of people do them because they feel like there's some added benefit to them. Like they give you some extra umph that you can't get from a more standard protocol. Whereas the supersetting, you know, there might be some perks there for you, but supersetting is something that perhaps is best left for at least the middle of the road intermediate and perhaps on yeah if machines and if. I were to use them, I would definitely have some sort of system in place so that like maybe my drops were standardized. Like maybe it's just one drop at like 15% or something like that and it's RPE9 and that way I can kind of compare my performance over time and adjust. So, so yeah, no magic there. They're just, I think, more so convenient when it comes to time saving. Well said. Cool. Next one. I like this one. This is about uh, when you should get a coach. So this question is also from Lululemon. How much value is there for an intermediate powerlifter, for example, that 1,000 totally talked about, to get a powerlifting coach versus following one from the online standard intermediate templates that are out there? Uh, he used a good example from Bryce Lewis. That's actually a very good program from TSA. I know having a more tailored program by a knowledgeable coach is very helpful for advanced lifters, but I'm curious how much difference it makes for an intermediate lifter uh, who already has form down, but it's just not strong yet, just still weak. And there's actually a research article I saw that came out, and I don't remember if it was on resistance training or not, I think it was, but it found that tailored individualized training programs were no better than a standard one for beginners. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to point out that when you're a beginner, everything works, yeah. you know, so long as there's some kind of logical consistency to it, you're going to do well. And, um, but my opinion here is that a thousand, a thousand pound total while you probably feel weak when you get on Instagram, you're a trained person, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, what's that, that's two, three, four, right? Mm -hmm. It's a 200 pound bench, 300 pound squat, 400 pound deadlift, mm -hmm. like that's substantially stronger than yeah. someone who's never lifted weights, yeah. you know? So I think you might be at that point, if you're not making progress, uh, where it would be a good idea to seek out a coach. And that's, again, if you're not making progress using one of these um, logically based templates that are out there, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like um, not adding things you don't need as crutches before you need them. Uh, but that said, I, I prefer having a coach as my personality um, in any sport. It, some people just might, maybe you just want the psychological assurance that you're on the right track. Um, what else? Maybe your goals are like, I would like to continue progressing in this, but... I would also like my my physique is getting weak in these certain places, or I'm being when I do these blocks, I get hurt in this certain area, or because it's not just plateau and strength gains, it's plateaus and maybe motivation, maybe physique parts, maybe um, I don't know, maybe you just want advice. Just like I know people just, just consult with you just to assessing. consult. Like if someone who's more experienced can help assess. Mm -hmm. Reassurance yeah. And there's different things. types of coaching, right? Like, for example, with us, like, maybe you don't want weekly coaching, but you do want a one-time, like, hey, this is my setup. Does it seem logical? Can I continue with this? Which is why we have different types of coaching. But there's almost a, a good coach with a good, uh, I'll say a good program, but a, a good communication method that works for you in alignment with your goals. Because if, if you go to someone and say, like, I just like this checked out a little bit, and they're like well, if you want to sign up, you have to check in me four times a week. And it's like, that's not a, a good fit for you. Um, so 
Right. Like you might not need it, but would it be helpful? And do you have that income, right? Maybe the amount at which it's helpful is not worth the amount of money you're, you're able to spend right now. So those are the things to consider. I wish I would have gotten a coach earlier, to be honest. Yeah, like, me too. Hey, when I think back, <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of trouble. I think when I was in that phase where I thought I knew more than I actually did and I would get in my own way quite a bit. So yeah. going back now, I think, yeah, once things started to get right around there, when things get difficult and like yeah. progressing is just not showing up and, and working harder and I start to make irrational decisions, I think looking back now, uh, it would have been a wise investment. I think for me too, because I, I did have success early on fast, Yeah. but it taught me like, oh, I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So it kind of just closed me down where I wasn't able to learn more because I was just like, I got this. Yeah. And obviously I didn't. <laughs> so. But it worked out. So like, that's the thing is like, what is working out versus not? Yeah. Like at least if you, you're at least learning lessons on your own. Like there's different ways to look at it. But um, in my opinion, I don't know how often, it sounds like because you have such good questions and because... I mean, you follow us, which I think is a smart thing to do. <laughs> I not to toot our own horns, but you probably would enjoy being coached, and it would probably because you're so inquisitive, at least ease your mind a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I was the same way. Um, so, not that I know everything about you, but they're good questions, mm-hmm. and you sound very interested and well read. So, you might you might have that personality that we tend to see that really flourishes under a coaching wing. Yeah, and I would say you're probably doing better for yourself than you think. I mean, you're yeah. 25. <laughs> You've gone from 30% body fat to something enough where you have loose skin, which is a great job. You've got a thousand pound total, and you're you know following powerlifting advice from TSA, which is yeah. and you're asking questions here. So like you know not to toot our own horns, but good radar. I think I think you have you have you have good critical thinking skills. So I think whatever you end up doing is probably going to be a well thought out decision. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And for those that don't, I mean, like Andrea said, this is psychology and the excitement of having coaching is sometimes more worth any amount of money that you could pay yeah. you guys are going to probably frown on me for for saying this but i was helping out a, a young man back home um who was feeling the urge to have coaching because he was feeling he was you know a little bit plateaued and uh, ironically he was using uh Shiko, who you know we've all used mm-hmm. in our experience and so uh i said you know i Shiko's a good program you know i don't know if you necessarily need to come to me for for coaching is I just I just need that accountability I just need that assignment so I just took the Shiko program and made it into our template and used our Excel spreadsheets mm-hmm. but otherwise it was the exact same program mm-hmm. and I says you just got to check in once a month I says just get oh this is so awesome his excitement <laughs> was just off the chart and of course when you're excited like that and you actually do your training like it's prescribed progress started happening even though it was the same program that he had already been using. Now, of course, I didn't charge him for it. He was a young man. He's just local, you know. <laughs> but still, it just goes to show you what, you know, the mind and, and having that assignment, that excitement can do for you. Yeah. And with me, it's just peace of mind. Like, I will overthink and dance around in my head until someone tells me there's calm down the switch. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, from Peter Bowman, thoughts on adrenal fatigue. Is it a myth? I know some people who never cycle off caffeine and stims and appear to be fine. I've always cycled off to reset style myself, etc. Um, and define it first. So that that's exactly the issue is that mm-hmm. defining uh, adrenal fatigue. Uh, there's there's not a clear diagnostic criteria, and it overlaps a lot with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and also overtraining syndrome in athletes. Um, so you know you could look at that one of two ways. You go, oh well then it is sort of real. Like if it's really similar to those and those are real issues or it's really similar to those. And if you get misdiagnosed with having quote unquote adrenal fatigue, you're not getting the appropriate treatment. So I would say at this stage, adrenal fatigue is not studied or even proven to be real. It's possible that something like that could be happening and that maybe overconsumption of stims could have problems and that could be combined with chronic fatigue type of stuff or overtraining, but it's probably something else. And going to the type of person who would, um, I say type of person because I don't want to say type of professional who would di- diagnose you with adrenal fatigue might be you not getting dealt with a real medical issue that could be potentially be life threatening. So I, I would uh, stray away from the whole adrenal fatigue diagnosis. 
Um, if you want to read more about this, go to Holistic Performance Institute. Just Google Holistic Performance Institute Position Stand Adrenal Fatigue, and they've got a really good article on that. And this is actually like an evidence-based website for naturopaths, which actually is a thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, they've got some really good stuff where they have like, um, you know, non-traditional medicine that's all based on stuff that has research behind it. So that's a, a group of people who would have a the right kind of perspective on this and yet still would be able to take the science. So I checked that out. Very cool. I didn't know that. Like I know you did uh, talks with them, but I didn't know like that's, that was there. Yeah. That's kind of their thing. Yeah. They, cool. they do continuing education for nutritionists, which is actually a thing in New Zealand. It's not just a term that you say when you don't have an RD. Um, <laughs> you can be a he clinical leaves nutritionist. America and all he does is talk about America. Yeah. God. So yeah. So PTs, naturopaths and clinical nutritionists and dietitians, they uh, do a lot of continuing education there. Cool. Uh, so, yeah. Next question is from Lori Buchanan, 105. Um, question. 52-year-old female, 5'4", 138 at 18% body fat, competing in figure for the first time, May 2018. Uh, I'm genetically blessed with muscle gains, so she gains muscle pretty easily. Awesome. Roughly what macros would you recommend for bulking? Ooh. So the reason why I wanted to answer this question is because I think a lot of people do think, and I remember I remember thinking the same way, that if I just plug my age, my body weight, my body fat percentage um, into a calculator, there was an answer to this. There was a specific amount of macros that would be correct just based on my stats. What we've found through coaching and what we know from looking at like individual data and studies is that there's a huge amount of variance. And anyone who tells you they can give you the correct macros just based on stats is either ignorant or lying to you. Um, so I would say this is something you need to learn like you can start in the ballpark of what makes sense I would check out the muscle and strength pyramids to get kind of like your baseline the free videos there free videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to buy anything um, And then uh, from there. It's all about individual adjustments Right to back that up. I've weighed the same for three years I've eaten from oh, I think 1800 to now probably closer to 2500 calories a day looking very different, weighing the same, being about your height, about your weight, pretty close. And I've, yeah, cause I'm 5'2", 145, but the first time I was this, y'all guys saw me at that show where I was like crying. I was very puffy um, and not eating a lot. I'm gonna be 16, 700 calories. And now I look very different. I had a very ginormous burger for lunch. <laughs> they were there, uh, but no, it's closer. It's almost never under two thousand, and sometimes up to like three thousand. And I guess I hear that. And my training is the, very different. Training. My training, training is very different. So, um, and we've seen competitors get on stage. Like if you take any even professional bodybuilding stage, right? The way all those guys or girls or whatever they train very drastically different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they probably eat very, very different. I mean, look at you two. Like, Bird and Jeff trained very different from each other. Mm -hmm. And they're both top pros, so... I always like to use the yeah. example of what my macros have to get down to for me to get shredded. <laughs> yeah, this Berto's is fun. Macros. Okay. So I compete at 180 low pounds, and Berto competes at 160 low pounds, so a 20-pound difference. Um, and I have to typically get down around just below 2,000 calories, even if I do everything right, uh, to get there in the end. And that's with, you know, eight months of dieting. Berto, how's, how's it for you? There's a point where I have to get down to 2,500 for a minute, but... Weighing 20 pounds less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how much cardio are you doing? Uh, whatever my girlfriend wants to do. So it's kind of optional. Hey. Yeah, so optional cardio. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so Berto competing 20 pounds lighter than me with the same job. Yeah, <laughs> Literally. Job. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, and similar volume of training. We both yeah. train relatively mm -hmm. high volume. Uh, 600 calories less, or 600 calories more than he eats, and I'm doing daily cardio. And I get most of my work done over 3,000 calories, to be honest. Yeah. When I average out the week, it's quite a bit of above that early and, on. And, but she's talking gaining, so what are y'all yeah. now? What are you at now? Well, I don't say now because you just finished prep, but your yeah. normal off-season intake versus and body weight. Well, here's the thing is like, it just I'm just going back to whatever I do in the off-season. Which is? Just eat whatever I want almost mm -hmm. within the good habits that I have in the off-season. Whatever keeps me in Could the one Could you give a, calorie, a caloric ballpark? Back when, back when you tracked, what do you think you needed to gain? Um, 
It's just so different. Once I get close to 180, it's like weight gains, right? It, was, like, it just fights me. Um, I'd say to just make it into the 170s, I think to stay in the 170s is probably like 36, 3,800 calories. And I eat just around there to get to 220 and maintain 220. This is so I stay in, like out Damn of the one sixty. Yeah. yeah, but again, again, the big part is like if people forget about the the training aspect, especially in the off season. Like you're so pliable when it comes to, especially like the ratios past a certain point. You know, like your fat and carbs are a little bit more pliable than you would think, and it's more about getting the protein and the calories consistent. And then if there is a place to really split hairs, like especially for bodybuilders, like the powerlifters get this. I wish they'd eat more protein sometimes, but they get this part, the planning out their training and just how important that is. And like, if you go back to like, if you're like, like at a big power of me, like, well, like, these guys have a crap ton of muscle. Yeah. And often their diet is like, for reals, dude, like, yeah. mm-hmm. you have waffles for breakfast and orange juice and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but when it comes to their training, they, they plan that stuff out like weeks and months, uh, you know, ahead of time. And I think that's, that's a skill. Something that once you dabble into as a, as a bodybuilder, like, especially in the off season, you spend so much more time, like just really wrapped up around that and trying to get the most out of that system. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, yeah. E- e- so we touched on the whole fact that macronutrients are not just based Step on stats. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Mm-hmm. But um, even more so, like Berto just kind of brought up, is your macros for bulking way less important than your macros for cutting. Yeah. yeah. If you yeah. tackle, if, if you ensure you get at least 0.8 grams per pound of protein and you're gaining at an appropriate weight rate and you're getting some fruits and vegetables and you're drinking enough water, that's pretty much all you need to keep, keep track of. Because mm-hmm. you're going to have the appropriate surplus if you're gaining at an appropriate rate. And if, and if you wanted to get more meticulous in that, which, I mean, some people do. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you get enjoyment from it. I mean, just you got you to gotta establish a baseline that's customized to you. And this is where a lot of times, especially with my Skype consultations, I insist. I, I won't consult with them unless I have two or three weeks of data. Mm. I don't even care if they have macro targets. I just want them tracking food. Just calories is fine. Mm-hmm. And then maybe getting two or three body weights a week. If I can compare those two things over the course of three weeks, I can pretty much tell not only what their surplus or deficit is, I can calculate what their maintenance is, and then I can kind of get an activity factor that will give a person a baseline of maintenance at any body weight. And I'm pretty sure all that's in the pyramid. Is it in the books or is it in the videos? I can't both. remember which. Probably both. Yeah. But that's, if, I was, if, if you wanted to be more meticulous than that and you wanted to actually program a rate of gain, um, get yourself good, reliable, nah, not even reliable. Just get good, just get data and then just go to those resources and just program it. Well said. Yeah. And give it some time. Don't go to that resource, pick macros and two weeks later, find the other resource and use mm-hmm. those macros. Yeah. <laughs> but like you said, in the off season, does it really matter? They're probably going to, they should be approximately within a couple hundred calories of each other and, and any one of those is fine. Can we get AC in here? Yeah. Is there anything? I can, I can, I can do it. I just was wondering if it was on. So I just ate till sometimes you can't tell the difference. <laughs> Bert's got the meat sweats for the so, listeners, so I'm gonna go turn. The, <laughs> I'm gonna go turn the AC on. All right. While Andrea is fixing, <laughs> is fixing Bert's meat sweats. <laughs> he had two big burgers too. The next question is from Owen Ramsey. Is your body fat set point established genetically, or does the set point a person has? as an adult depend on what their body fat percentage was during their time as a youth. And the extension of this question is, the reason this matters to me is that I'm 18 years old and I'm wondering whether I should cut to a fairly low body fat percentage, try to maintain it for a few years in order to lower my set point for the rest of my life, or if I should just accept that my set point is genetic and focus on gaining muscle with some fat being put on along the way. Who wants to start with this one? Well, I, From what I heard. You know, I'm going to start. You go ahead. I, I'm just going to just forget all about the body fat set Definitely. point because yeah. I don't know enough about that. However, 18 years old, I mean, I can't tell you how many 18-year-olds I try to discourage from doing any cutting because you're really in the prime of your life for building muscle. I mean, sometimes I wish I could just draw the amount of testosterone that an 18-year-old is making and inject it into my body 
because it's literally that potent. <laughs> you can do that. So. You just have to join a different coaching company. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, outside of the whole body fat set point and what it is that you're trying to accomplish there, just take advantage of this point in your life and uh, enjoy yeah. the gains with a Z. Mm. <laughs> well, and I'd say with the body fat set point, it's like, I can almost guarantee there's no 18 year old that has reached it. It's there's so like you said there's so much potential that it's like if you think you're stuck then you're most likely doing something pretty fundamentally a little off to well, to I, be pretty I, stuck but I, go ahead I don't think they're saying they're stuck I think what he's saying is I want to see if I program can, it as I'm 18 can I cut now and maintain it and then permanently lower my set point? No one likes this answer. Like, it's been asked for like years now. <laughs> like, it's, like, we just need to say yes, whatever you like. You I can. mean, anyone but can. It's not the truth. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, you're lying, like anyone, changing your metabolism. Yeah. Um, no, I think, yeah, well, your physiological set point, that's, that's your set point. And it's, uh, yeah, it's partially genetic and then one question that I always ask when I'm consulting with someone is, so growing up, were you overweight or underweight or, you know, like, you know, how, how did that look basically? And I even go a little bit further sometimes, like if they were thin, I'll even ask like, so were you like thin with abs and like looked hard, you know? Like you see those teenagers, it's just like, like Evan Godby, really good natural bodybuilder, like he, he told me what he looked like like growing up and I'm like, oh dude, that's like a little hard kid with like good nutrient partition. You just feed him for days. He's gonna mm -hmm. gain a ton of muscle. And uh, and that's exactly how, how that worked out. But but yeah, I think it's 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 genetic, it's it's your environment, especially early on is your body's kind of like reading the environment and you know, make some calls based off that. But uh, it, the closest thing you can get to rewiring your set point and this is this is this is funny because this is not what people want to hear. It happens behaviorally when you're eating enough. Like that is when people learn to be leaner. It's not when you're like starving in the middle of a fat loss diet. Like you took all these great habits that you can bring over to like the rest of your life. No, like eating Arctic Zero and, and like you know like you know, high fiber this, high fiber that, and a salad that big. That's not how you're going to live the majority of your life, or you shouldn't, anyways. But you know, spending enough time eating enough, you're going to be able to pick up a lot of good habits that over time are going to make you leaner. And it's funny because like for a natural bodybuilder, you would think your weight over the years would kind of do this in like the off season when you're gaining. It's kind of the other way around. Maybe for a while it does that. And then you get to the point where you're like at that advanced ish stage. And if anything, you, you find that there's like, there's a, you're, you're like where you casually cut to usually and that you're top in weight. They, they just become like top and weight when you're gaining they actually get a little bit closer like over over time like this was the first off season I think I saw one way in over 184 like that had never happened before and a lot of it's just because behaviorally it's like this is like the best I've ever been when it comes to to managing my off season and I can stay leaner leaner than I could have say you know five seven years ago and I didn't rewire my anything um, physiologically speaking, but I'm just much better at my everyday living habits. When you just have more muscle. Yeah, I train more. Like the, all well, these, the same yeah. set point, like let's say, this is like super not science, let's say you have a centimeter of fat surrounding you, mm -hmm. like if there's a lot more muscle underneath that, you're going to look far more jacked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, and in this time, case, that's very... Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, like 18, it's like I don't think it's, you know your set point. It's something that should even be concerning him in the first place that's what's frustrating me you have all the gain potential right yeah you're, you're, focused you're on. so focused on trying to look aesthetically pleasing but you haven't even built a foundation yet yeah the goal is to get muscle right the question that's what the question was yeah. the goal to get muscle so it's like Eating why drink. stressing <laughs> on body fat levels as long as you're not like unhealthy mm -hmm. just lift and eat Within reason, of course. Well, and like nothing, like I've, this is one thing I've mentioned a few times of, uh, of late to people is that nothing's going to remodel the way you look, um, the way putting on muscle is going to. Like nothing's going to recomp you in that manner. I think this is especially highly evident with women sometimes that like they finally commit to like three years or so of just like eating enough and training hard and they're like, wow, everything that I was looking for via fat loss. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> doing like eating enough and lifting weights progressively. Mm -hmm. So I'll step in just to help you on the analytical side of it. If you're still wondering, 
So what's the science? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter, like Jeff said. But I'll, I'll, I'll indulge you to help you realize it doesn't matter and really buy into it. Um, the, the truest term right now is a settling point instead of a, a set point because it is both genetics and environment and behavior. In fact, I just recently saw something online about these two uh, genetic twins who were raised by different parents, and one was obese and one was quite lean. So right there we know it can't just be all genetics. Does genetics play a role? Yes. Um, but you can't change that point anyway. And even if you did modify your behavior so much so that you could hang out at the leanest place possible without really trying, that's not probably a good place to gain muscle from anyway. It would hamper your long-term goals. So you, so long as you're at a healthy body fat percentage, so for as a male, that's anything less than say 20%, maybe even the low 20s would probably be fine too. Um, just lift weights and get bigger because set point is a range. It is modified by your genetics. It's modified by your environment and your behaviors and it'll change over time. Like Berto said, as you get better and better at this whole bodybuilding lifestyle. If you eat a ton of foods that are very satiating, if your diet consists primarily of white potatoes, you know, broccoli, apples, and lean meats, and dairy, uh, low-fat dairy, uh, then you would find yourself lighter than if you were just to ad libitum eat you know, Taco Bell all the time. Because <laughs> one is going to give you a lot more calories, be less satiating, and the other's the opposite. That doesn't make the genetics different, but it, one will make it harder for you to gain muscle. One will make it easier to gain muscle, but also easier to gain a lot of body fat. So you want to find that, that right balance. And what I would suggest is if you're not overweight and if you're not obese currently, focus on gaining 18, like 1% of your body weight per month for two to three years while making steady progress on the compound lifts in the gym. And at that point, then you can think, should I bulk or cut? And ask the same question that 1,600 people ask me every day. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. That was a good one. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Good question, Alan. All right, this one I think we're going to have fun with. Uh, Southern Engineer to Transform, that's actually his actual name. That is yep, great. actual name, birth name, asks <laughs> us, uh, what is each person in 3DMJ's personal sports goal, and what is our vision for 3DMJ? Sports goal? Each person's personal sports goal. Um, and then the collective vision, or, I mean, it's the same. We should, hopefully we have the same I know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I thought you like each person's vision. I'm like, I think it's kind of the same thing. So like, what's our vision for 3DMJ and then what's each person's, let's start with Brad. What's your personal goal in your sport or sports of choice? Very much strength related at the point, at, at the current time. Of course it's evolved, so it could change in the next two or three years. But I think big overall goal is I want a 600 kilo total which is 13, 13 30-ish. Yeah, something like that. That's my big goal right now. And I think I can actually attain that in 2018. I really do. Um, expanding on that, I would love to you know, do that at a lower body weight because that's technically an elite total. And um, elite, elite classification in bodybuilding is, that would be the Super Bowl for me. Bodybuilding or powerlifting? Powerlifting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because bodybuilding is it, it's so subjective, you know? It, it would, I, th I think that would be winning the Super Bowl for me. I think that would supersede earning a pro card, actually earning money, doing a bodybuilding show. Um, yeah, I think that would be the Super Bowl for me. Cool. Great. Alberto? Oh, we're we just going with over a personal goal. Each person, person. Mm -hmm. sports, personal sports. At the moment. Sports sports thing. Thing. At the moment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, shoot. Um, man, I think uh, long term, I would like to win a lightweight title as a bodybuilder. That's like... A world title? Uh, yeah, world title. Absolutely. A world title. Um, and in regards to... I just got so many. But uh, so many that are personal that don't matter to anyone else but myself. But that's Sports just kind of... Yeah, that's just kind of like I have these performance marks that I want to take care of. The Lakers. What you no, go ahead. I said I want to own the Lakers. It was a joke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to own the Lakers, do you? you know, own the Warriors. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's, there's. I have a list. It's like super long about things that I want to do in regards to like my own bodybuilding. Um, and it's funny because like even though I compete, I think I use competition as a means to get 
to like yeah to, to encourage me to push for those goals like to add a little bit of like healthy pressure if you will but more than anything at the end of every season like I just I, I take a step back I'm like are you satisfied with what you did from beginning to end were you satisfied with that, that off season and to me it's like figuring all this stuff out is probably the, the part that I get the most joy out of so um, yeah just to continue to progress yes do well at the sport but just continue to enjoy it simply because it's 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 still the favorite my favorite part of my day like it's been like this since like I was 16 like I still remember we're talking about like missing notes in class because of you know <laughs> hormonal outrage as a teenager but <laughs> but at, at the same time like I, I would think about like my training session I remember in class and I'm like I'm rock back with those dumbbells I'm gonna get seven reps today oh crap you missed that whatever she said right the teacher person um, so it's still kind of the same way and I just want to keep that going and I want to always be ex- excited about my training and healthy enough to to progress in, in some way if we my turn I think if this question was asked a year and a half ago when I am I prepping still what am I you don't don't ask me no. <laughs> you're in charge <laughs> I would say yeah I was like kind of on the same page as Berta like I want to win a title world title or like the top three because I think when you're top three you could say you're kind of on the elite side I haven't hit that yet so that was a, but I would say now that's late not that important um probably over the last couple of months I was really starting to realize that me just getting into the gym is kind of like a victory at this point just because I've been doing this for so long and my body feels tired at times so and I love training still I think so I think the longevity part is more of my goal now like I think it would be cool to say I've been doing this for 40 years or even 50 and I don't think you're gonna see, you don't see too many people who are putting themselves out there that have that type of longevity. So to me, that's more of a priority goal for me now than winning a world title. It would be nice to win a world title. And I'm definitely gonna try, but I think if I make it to 40, I think that's kind of probably be more worth celebrating. So that's kind of my bodybuilding goal right now. But as far as like performance, it's nah those those goals are kind of out the window now it's more about just staying in one piece and keep enjoying and sustaining words so for me I have goals in both uh, bodybuilding and powerlifting Um, I think the way I'm going to contextualize it for powerlifting is that if my body lets me meaning I won't push if it doesn't um, I would like to squat over 500 pounds and I would like to total over 1400 pounds and I think I'm actually really close to that um, but I did get surgery back in February and that was a really good move because I can actually squat pain free but I do notice that I have a small margin for error for what I can do without causing pain and I'm certainly not willing to have to go through surgery ever again so I am willing at this point if my body does not seem to cooperate with my goal of moving 1,400 pounds, of just switching to bodybuilding purely. Um, although I'm not, I'm still on the fence on that. So, but for bodybuilding, I purely just want to compete as a pro and not get blown away. That's basically. I just want to look the part. So, um, yeah, that's really it. Okay. Uh, my goals, if I had to summarize, is to do the hardest thing I can do athletically that fulfills me immediately forever <laughs> so right now I know right now that is uh, I've been ch- since I was 30 so for two years I've been chasing a goal a functional fitness goal which to some might just look like CrossFit but more specifically it's called the grid league it's an American sport or it's in America um, professional functional fitness race based sport so it's um, anyways it's really hard Everyone that's in it has been doing the stuff that I've been doing for way longer than two years, but I gave myself five years to do it. Uh, It's not a very... It's new. There's been three seasons of the Grid League. The fourth is coming up in April, as far as I know. Um, And there's only eight professional teams, so I really don't know if I'll make it this year. But the, the immediate goal is to continue improving until I make that. 
I gave myself till I'm 35. If I'm 35 and I still suck too much to make that, I might uh, do functional fitness competitions. Um, there's a thing called the International Functional Fitness Federation. A lot of Fs there. Um, but it's, it's trying. For sure. it's, it, <laughs> but it is the the governing body that is trying to get functional fitness into the Olympics. So um, there's strength and endurance goals there. So that's, that's the hardest shit I can think of right now, and I will keep chasing that for at least three more years. And at some point, I realized this, I won't be able to train twice a day when I'm like maybe 60-something, I don't know. No, but whenever it happens <laughs> that I can't go as hard for whatever reason, right, then I will probably either immediately maybe diet for a show, maybe get on a Olympic lifting or powerlifting platform again, I don't know. But at some point, I won't be able to do any of that, and it will only have to be Masters Bodybuilding, and I will do that until I can no longer do it. But that's kind of how I see my athletic life, is I'll always compete, I'll always train, it's never going to end, and I'll always do the, because I am in my 30s, the hardest thing I can do at that time until it runs out. That's it. I saw a really funny meme. About? Uh, <laughs> it looked like the timeline of, of someone who lifts weights. <laughs> and it said, 20s? Olympic weightlifting, 30s, powerlifting, 40s and older, bodybuilding. <laughs> so I'm in that meme? No. Um, but that's pretty much it, right? I want to do as much as I possibly can. So I'm trying to find my MRV in just sports. <laughs> that's about it. That's it. Maximum recoverable sports. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for that question. We didn't finish. Yeah, yeah we're going to do our... Oh yeah, vision that's of 3DMJ. Right. He didn't care about us. He's kicked out actually. What's 3DMJ again? Our vision with four people. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was. So that. who's gonna say what our vision is? Um, the Godfather. What do you see as the vision? <laughs> the vision. It's the journey. It's the journey. It's the journey. Um. I I think, speak to how it started, what was the... I was going to say, it's yeah. just, it's crazy to me to think, like, starting out, I was like, I'm just writing this little blog titled 3D Muscle Journey, and then meeting these guys with a bigger vision than what I had, because my vision was like, let me just put myself out there to help other people, and they're, they're about, hey, but we can reach even more people, so it's just like, I think we're just basically, the vision is to continue going this way and helping as many people as we possibly can because now we're, I'm actually talking into a blue microphone that's actually white but it's labeled blue <laughs> the company's named blue <laughs> podcast like helping even more people so I think our vision you guys correct me if I'm wrong is to just keep expanding upon that and continue helping as many people as possible because that's where our roots were and that's where our heart was from the very beginning was to try to help people. I like that, Jeff. And I will say, one thing that has not changed is our mission statement. Right. Mission statements remain the same, and we have just basically adapted what we do to the realities of the fitness industry and the ways to reach people. And the opportunities, yeah. And the opportunities that have come our way. As uncomfortable as that has made us at times, as we're not always on the same wavelength that social media advances at. Or the internet in general. Yeah. I may have gotten an Instagram account in 2016. Don't judge <laughs> Well, I feel like we're doing a good job of that. Because, like Jeff said, you know, once he realized that there was others who could help him expand that vision beyond what he could see, you know, now we've got this little ball of fire that is helping us to even take that to the next me. level. Yeah. Um, I was listening. Yeah. I can't knowing, see Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you can't see to, this little I'm, ball of fire. I'm, I'm pointing to Andrea uh, for those who can't see, but I feel like we keep doing that. I feel like we keep doing that, and, and you know, just thank God that we've got that vision. We've got somebody with that vision and that know-how that we probably would not have ever seen. Well, I th I think I'll be the first to admit too that while I <laughs> I know according to you I'm this ball of fire that has this vision, but I'm definitely <laughs> not the. There's people in the world with far greater business, social media, internet, everything sense than I do. But I think what always attracted Not me to you. knows us well. That's what I'm saying. What attracted yeah. me to you guys, though, it was like I developed this skill set, but 
I didn't really have anyone to, I didn't want to like save the world, but you guys saved me back in the day, right? And I know it sounds weird because people don't think bodybuilding is a big deal, but as you guys have heard me talk about a lot of times, I think it, and a lot of people that are listening, it can get really, really, really fucking dark. And I remember it ruining my life. And we can help people not do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, so it seemed like a better use of my resources. And yeah, and and that's how I want to use my fire. (laughs) So help help that. Um, Because I don't think it's like, I did personal training, and I know we all have, and it's like to help someone who's 50 pounds overweight become 40, like that's cool, but to keep someone from being like alone and losing their friends and like having eating disorders is a way bigger deal to me. Well, that's, if we go back to the early part of the question, like part of like my goal as an athlete, it's like, yeah, winning a world title is great, but I think what's even cooler, and I think watching him do his this prep this time was that I've never seen him help so many people through his prep than this mm-hmm. prep. Yeah. And that was to me was really cool to see and I'm more proud of that watching him do that versus him getting to the world stage. It was more about like shit, he look at how he helped so many people. Yeah. And he put, and it takes someone a lot of energy to put themselves out there like he did. And yeah. I think that doesn't he doesn't get enough credit for that. It's the easy thing to do to go inside and just be like, "All right, I'm going to just it myself up and just be a competitor and just focus on that and, and do it really really well it's the hard thing to do to do really well in your competition and look, probably get like a personal best I'd say as far as your look but then also use every one of your obstacles successes failures challenges and pivots along the way as instructional tools for the people who follow you so I, I agree with Jeff 100% Berto yeah. did a really great job with that and I think that's a, a really good example of how to be a leader in sport well, that think, helps me keep going. Well, like, that's well, like part of the purpose. Like we all interpret it a little different, and to me, it's like bodybuilding. It's, it's made my life a lot better, but there's still, like you said, some fucked up shit. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, I want to leave this better than how I found it because yeah. I won't be able to do this forever. And if we can do that as a team, and I do that like on yeah. the biggest scale possible, eventually, uh, I think that would be yeah. That'd be so like awesome. globally as a company. We say like help as many people. Like every company freaking yeah. in the world says that. But it's um, make as much money as possible and fuck everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what we're all trying to say. Actually, no. Um, but it's it's more like I think we should. I mean, I think we are. But I want to be very, very solidly established as the industry leader, the source of information mm-hmm. for someone who is trying to get on the bodybuilding stage yep. naturally. Yep. Like the source, and so. We've done a lot growing. I mean, we didn't have a podcast two years ago. We have like over, over hundred thousand downloads consistently now per month. We have sixty thousand YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's growing. It's growing. But I think um, it's just solidifying that. And I think the listeners have noticed too in the past, you know, few years that branching out into different mediums. Like it's not using the internet to just reach people, but it's like better ways of delivering the messages too. Like long form is now our thing because there's five of us and we're so you know a lot of while youtube was the thing we grew up and like Mm -hmm. that audience grew up and they want more in depth and so we're trying to give that and for the people who like the youtube that's cool but in the vault it's more organized and Mm -hmm. it's with tech supplements so not just spreading it but like we're the people that do follow us how do we get them how do we deliver it in a better way over and over and over so i don't know that's the vision. That's it. That's the okay. Vision. Thank you, dude. Did we do it? Yeah, that was real nice. You did well. We're what, 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 at what a, we long, out of time? a long time. We're at a long time. We, we can finish it there and do that part was, two as a, as a next podcast. That was really okay. good. That was a good place to end it, actually. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was okay. Thanks great. for the questions, Thank guys. Thank you for the questions. Question. And yeah. everyone else who, if you did not have your question answered, listen to the next one. Listen to our next one, or we may have selected your question to do in the next case study Q and A, probably coming out early next year. Is that accurate, Andrew? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be what we're going to call that. We think. Don't hold us to this. Is the case study Q and A three? Um, Brad, help me out. Virtual seminar. Virtual, virtual, virtual competition, competition prep seminar. seminar. There you go. <laughs> so, if you did not hear your question answered, 
and you saw those other questions after you, that's where it is. If you have not, if you've not answered your question yet, we will in our next podcast coming up shortly. Hey everybody, it's Eric Helms. Thanks for tuning into our podcast. As you know, at 3DMJ, we promote evidence-based approaches to the lifting community. If that's something you want to dive deeper into, I'd encourage you to check out my research review, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport, or for short, MASS. This is a review that myself, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Greg Knuckles put out every month. We cover the latest research publications that are applicable to strength and physique athletes, or anyone who's looking to get stronger or improve their body comp. Our content is in both written and video format. For more information on how to subscribe, check out 3dmusclejourney.com slash mass. That's 3dmusclejourney.com slash M-A-S-S for further details. Thanks for tuning in.